Hi, my name is Josh Solomon. I am an associate professor of medicine at National Jewish Health, and I'm going to give you a talk on connective tissue-related interstitial lung disease. The objectives are to recognize that interstitial lung disease can have many causes, and connective tissue is one. Understand the basic principles of diagnosis. Recognize that there are three that are more common to have an associated interstitial lung disease. Be able to appropriately evaluate new ILD patients for underlying connective tissue disease and appreciate that they can be subtle, these connective tissue diseases, but they are important to diagnose. Now, you probably already know what interstitial lung disease is, but just to bring us all together, uh, it's a diverse collection of disorders. There's over 200 of them, uh, and it's about 15% of what we see in a pulmonary clinic, and there's um, inflammatory subtypes and fibrotic subtypes, and we'll touch briefly on this. When we see patients with interstitial lung disease, uh, we think of different causes, and this is a great way to visualize it. Um, there are multiple different causes, and they fall in categories like drug-induced, uh, environmentally-induced lung diseases. There's an idiopathic category, and then there's a, a systemic disease category that includes connective tissue disease, and it makes up a significant portion of what we see in our clinic. There are challenges to connective tissue-related ILD. Uh, they can have a myriad of pulmonary manifestations, so you're, you're going to see that they can manifest in all aspects effects of the respiratory circuit. Uh, the incidence and prevalence is varied, so uh, some are rare, some are more common. Sometimes the connective tissue disease that you're looking at is really undefined, and, and there's not a lot of guidance to help us. This next slide is how we visualize connective tissue-related interstitial lung disease. There are those with established respiratory signs and symptoms. We'll talk about that. There are patients who have asymptomatic uh, interstitial lung disease, so interstitial lung abnormalities or subclinical ILD. We're not going to have time to talk about that, but that's important. And then I'll briefly touch on the uncharacterized or occult connective tissue disease. So interstitial lung disease and established connective tissue disease, uh, it's important to remember that all of the connective tissue diseases can be associated with ILD, but but really there are the three big that we big ones that we talk about, which is scleroderma RA and the myositis spectrum. And you can see interstitial lung disease in up to 90% of patients with scleroderma. All components of the respiratory system can be involved. And in general, and I say this is really in general, um, the prognosis is better for patients with connective tissue-related interstitial lung disease than with, say, idiopathic diseases such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is a brief slide on some of the manifestations of connective tissue disease. If you're on your own seeing these patients without the help of a rheumatologist, this is a nice reference uh, for the uh, features of RA, sclerosis, Sjogren's, and myositis. Um, and keep in mind that these are systemic diseases. So your physical exam will find findings in skin and in joints and in uh, obviously in lungs and in muscles. And so you really need to do a comprehensive exam to make sure you're not missing these. Don't forget the importance of hands. Uh, a lot of these diseases will manifest in hands and with, uh, with you can see here, we can, uh, we can see some ulnar deviation. We can see some telegitages, some uh, mechanics hands. So don't forget to look at the hands because that's really an important part of that exam and, and a place where you'll see a lot of these connective tissue diseases manifest. Now, if you look at the amount of uh, chest CT scan abnormalities in these diseases, you'll see that it's fairly high. Um, so if you just look at all uh, changes on a CT, this is in interstitial lung disease, airways disease, pleural disease, you'll see that uh, it's rare to have a normal CT in patients with connective tissue-related disease. Um, and so uh, we're going to see something if we scan these people. So here's a different, this is a nice uh, a table from Dr. Fisher and Dubois' uh, review in Lancet in 2012, talking about the specific manifestations uh, of the different connective tissue diseases. And you can see from this table that some are more likely to cause interstitial lung disease. Others are more likely to cause pleural disease. You can see the vascular disease in the form of pulmonary hypertension is much more common in systemic sclerosis. Pleural disease is much more common in lupus. And, but again, when you're talking about interstitial lung diseases, uh, we have the majority of these being caused by systemic sclerosis RA and, and the polymyositis spectrum. Uh, and a disease like lupus is very, very rare uh, to cause interstitial lung disease. So how do we diagnose it? Uh, HRCT patterns are really important. So the most common pattern we see um, in connective tissue-related ILD is a pattern called NSIP, standing for nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Um, in all of the connective tissue diseases other than rheumatoid arthritis is the most common pattern you'll see. And we're going to look at a picture of that and see what it looks like. In RA, RA stands alone in that it more commonly has 
usual interstitial pneumonia, which is a more fibrotic pattern and one with a worse prognosis. So rheumatoid arthritis is, is different than the rest in terms of what you're going to see on a CT scan. So these are representative images of NSIP. NSIP is defined as basilar and peripheral predominant with ground glass abnormalities, some reticulation, so reticulation of those dense white lines that represent fibrosis, and really not a lot of honeycombing, if any. Uh, if you see a lot of honeycombing, this is most likely not NSIP. So uh, it, again, is based on peripheral predominant. Sometimes you'll see sparing of the, uh, of the diaphragm, sparing of the periphery. Um, and so this is a good example of that. Th these are uh, coronal images, and you can see that this NSIP is sitting above the... Uh, sitting above the diaphragm, but sparing that absolute periphery. So this is a very typical uh, look for NSIP. Now UIP is different. It is also basilar and peripheral predominant, but has very little, if any, ground glass opacity. If you have a lot of ground glass, it doesn't qualify for UIP. Um, and it has reticulation, and it has traction bronchiectasis often, which is pulling open of those airways from fibrosis, and it can have honeycombing. Um, if you have honeycombing, you have a definitive UIP pattern. If you don't have honeycombing but have all these other features, um, then we call it probable usual interstitial pneumonia. But this is a more fibrotic pattern. That's why you don't see a lot of that ground glass abnormality that we see in NSIP. And these are, again, um, coronal images showing that where this sits. So this sits in the periphery, in the basal portion of the lungs. And what you can see sometimes is that this, pat this fibrosis will be along the basilar part of the lungs and then creep up the side of the lungs. Uh, very typical for UIP. Now, uh, there are some radiographic differences to help you distinguish UIP that's associated with connective tissue disease versus idiopathic. Um, and so um, uh, these are some of the features here. And this is from a nice paper uh, in 2018 by Dr. Chung. And what he does is looks at these signs, and the, the, the signs um, include anterior upper lobe signs. So do you have fibrosis in the anterior upper lobe, which, is, which suggests connective tissue-related ILD? Do you have exuberant honeycombing, which means you have a lot of honeycomb in the base of that lungs? And do you have what's called a straight edge, where you have a straight demarcation between honeycombing and normal lung? So those three signs are fairly um, predictive, and if you have all, all of those uh, signs, it's, it's quite predictive that this is most likely a connective tissue-related ILD and not an idiopathic ILD. So when you see these patients, you really need to figure out, is this ILD related to the connective tissue disease? And almost always it is, meaning if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you have ILD, it is almost always related to rheumatoid arthritis. That doesn't mean that patients with connective tissue disease can't get other things in their lungs, and they can, and sometimes it can mimic ILD. So obviously they're at risk for infection because they are immune suppressed. There is drug-related interstitial lung disease, though this is less common. Um, my slide has methotrexate still on there, though I crossed it out because there are two publications this year um, that really look at methotrexate and I think lay to rest this idea that methotrexate causes interstitial lung disease. And I think we're fairly confident it does not. Um, but there are other drugs that can do it. They can have environmental diseases. So you can get hypersensitivity pneumonitis if you have RA or if you have scleroderma. And obviously, uh, they can get smoking-related lung disease. So you can see DIP, uh, RBILD in these, in these subjects. Um, you can see Langerhans. And so just keep in mind that they can get some of the other ILDs, but most of the time, their ILD will be related to their connective tissue disease. Now, we get asked this question a lot, do I biopsy? And my answer is almost always no. Um, the reason being, and I list some of them here, and we wouldn't have time to go into the data uh, to support this, but clarifying what's on pathology often doesn't seem to affect prognosis. Um, and so if you, if you see NSIP versus UIP, for most people, doesn't affect the prognosis. And often, um, the radiographs can predict what's on pathology. So, for instance, an RA, which you're more worried if they have UIP. Um, a, a pattern of UIP on CT scan is very predictive of UIP on biopsy, and there's data to support that. Um, the second point about biopsy is that um, we're often treating them anyways, and so is it going to change what you're treating them with? And, and probably not. And finally, uh, I would say lung biopsy is really reserved for those atypical presentations. So if you have someone with RA and a UIP pattern or an NSIP pattern, you don't need to biopsy that. It's not going to change anything. If you have scleroderma with an NSIP pattern, a biopsy is not going to change anything.
If you have atypical presentations, unilateral disease, really dense infiltrates, those are the people that you really want to figure out what that is. And that's most likely not directly related to their connective tissue disease. It may be drug induced, it may be malignancy, it may be hemorrhage. So let's talk briefly about the three big ones. So rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease. We see ILD in about 30 to 40% of RA. That's a lot of people. Uh, in about up to 10%, it leads to their death. And so this is a significant disease that I think that gets underappreciated. As I mentioned, they predominantly have UIP, which is more fibrotic. Um, their survival is somewhere from three to seven years. That's without treatment. Um, and, and don't forget with all of these that the ILD can precede the joint disease. So in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they can have ILD and then uh, wake up in a few months to years later with RA. And so keep an open mind when someone has ILD that they may develop a connective tissue disease down the line. Scleroderma is the one where we see the most ILD. So 70-90% of patients will have ILD on a CT. Uh, these patients, it is recommended that we screen these patients for ILD. So everybody with scleroderma should get a CT scan at some point. Uh, and it usually develops close to the time of the diagnosis of scleroderma. So if you have had someone who has scleroderma for 15 years and doesn't have ILD, their chance of developing it is quite low. Now they predominantly have an NSIP pattern on HRCT. Uh, and their survival is about 85% of five years, which uh, is pretty good. Finally, myositis-associated interstitial lung disease. Um, this one is also uh, relatively common, and it has a very unique pattern of NSIP with organizing pneumonia. So you can see at the bottom of this slide, there's a picture from a review we wrote a while back showing this patient with NSIP, so they have peripheral reticulation in ground glass, and then they've got patchy ground glass throughout that's more uh, centrally located. So that's a very typical look for myositis-associated ILD, which can be either with polymyositis or, the anti or in the form of the antisynthetase syndrome, which I put some criteria down there for. So these patients uh, have a very, uh, usually a very responsive lung disease. Um, uh, this NSIP and organizing pneumonia will often respond well to immune suppression. So let's talk about management. This is the general approach is that treatment data are quite limited. So we don't have a lot of guidance in the literature outside of scleroderma, and I'll mention that. Uh, don't forget that not all of these are progressive, and so uh, you really want to see is someone progressing, um, and you want to follow them closely. You know, keep in mind that they're on other drugs for their connective tissue disease, and so drug-drug interactions are something you really want to keep an eye on. Um, and, and just be careful. You're suppressing, going to probably suppress the immune system to treat these interstitial lung diseases in someone who already has a suppressed immune system. So just keep those general treatment guidelines in mind. And so who do I treat? I treat the following, and this is makes sense. I think this is common sense. We treat people who have clinically significant symptoms. So if you come in and you are definitely short of breath from your lung disease, I treat people who have advanced disease when I meet them. So even if you're not symptomatic, but you have a lot of disease, I'm going to treat you. Or if I know that you're progressing. So I think those are general guidelines for treatment that would really um, uh, really pertain to anyone with ILD. Uh, but really advanced disease, progressive disease, or symptomatic disease. Those are the people that I'm going to consider putting on therapy. So what do I treat with? In general, um, patients with... The NSIP variety will get treated with uh, anti-inflammatory therapies because that's an inflammatory lung disease. And nowadays, patients with the UIP or fibrotic subtype will get an antifibrotic because now we have um, antifibrotics to choose from that we can treat these subjects with. Now, that's a general guideline. Um, there are some caveats to that. But um, in general, it's a decision between anti-inflammatory therapy and antifibrotic therapy. So let's briefly cover some of the drugs. We don't have much time, but um, microfamily mofetel or Celsept is a really good drug for the inflammatory subtype of ILD. It's, it's good because it's well tolerated. Um, you do have to monitor patients in terms of LFTs and the CBC, but patients really tolerate this drug well. So this should be your drug of choice, in my opinion, to replace prednisone, right? We, we used to treat people on prednisone long-term to help with these inflammatory lung diseases. That's obviously not the right move because of all the side effects of prednisone. So uh, I would strongly say, I'd strongly advise if you have someone responding to a short prednisone course, if they are responding, quickly drop that prednisone and add another agent to replace it, such as Celsep. This is a review 
uh, in 2013 looking at um, connective tissue related ILD patients and cell sept. And we found that it was safe uh, and effective. And actually, even in patients with a UIP pattern, they seem to do better after we initiate cell sept. So it's a safe and effective drug. There's no randomized controlled trials. Rituximab is also a really nice drug to use. It's uh, an infusion every six months. It is an anti-CD20 therapy, so it, it reduces your B cells. And this is just a number of case series. You can see case series in all the major connective tissue diseases where they use rituximab. There's not a randomized controlled trial. The benefits of rituximab is it's every six months. Um, the downside is that it's expensive, uh, but, but really well tolerated. So rituximab is usually one that we use for salvage, meaning I have you on cell sept or mycophenolate and you are progressing and I need another agent. Uh, in scleroderma, we have some good data, right? We have SLS1 and SLS2. Those are two randomized controlled trials in scleroderma. Uh, SLS1 looked at cyclophosphamide um, in these patients. And what it found was if you treat patients with cyclophosphamide, um, and they, it's effective um, on the vital capacity. But once you stop that cyclophosphamide, they revert back. So your, um, your treatment effect is not, does not last. SLS2 looked at two years of mycophenolate or one year of cyclophosphamide. And what it found was no differences in the outcomes between those two. And if you know cyclophosphamide, you know it's, an, uh, it's a drug with a lot of toxicity. So SLS2 taught us that, hey, cyclophosphamide works, but we can use a drug such as mycophenolate, which is easier to tolerate and safer without a difference in outcomes. And so that really told us, hey, cell sept works in these people. Now, uh, you're probably familiar with the new trial that came out in 2019, the census trial. This was uh, looking at patients with systemic sclerosis, and it looked at nintetinib, which is a uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is a antifibrotic therapy that is approved in IPF in the U.S., uh, versus placebo, and it looked over 52 weeks, um, and it enrolled patients with fibrosis. And what it saw was um, when you put patients uh, on nintetinib versus placebo, that you had a slower rate of decline over time in your forced vital capacity. So this was a different population than SLS 1 and 2. That enrolled patients with more of an inflammatory underlying lung disease. To get into this trial, you had to have fibro more fibrotic lung disease. You had to have 10% fibrosis. And so you can see that this slowed down decline in those patients, right? You saw a benefit to patients with inflammatory lung disease on cyclophosphamide or cell sep. So do different patient populations. What this tells us is that patients with systemic sclerosis who have more of an NSIP without fibrosis, those patients should be treated with cell sept. If you have fibrotic disease, this looks like uh, nintetinib is effective. Um, and then finally, the big trial that came out, um, the, the inbuild trial. So this trial um, was really large. It looked at patients with progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease, which is defined on this slide. Um, and... Uh, in that trial, that was a big trial, 663 subjects, 170 had connective tissue-related ILD, various different types, and I'm showing you they had rheumatoid arthritis. I think rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma were the primary uh, patients in that trial, uh, and they got randomized to nintetinib or placebo, but you had to have progressing fibrosing interstitial lung disease as defined in this, uh, on this slide, which is a change in nevodal capacity with some increase in fibrosis or worsening symptoms. And if you had that and you got put on nintetinib, you can see this is a um, this is 52 weeks on the x-axis and the change in baseline in the vital capacity. You can see that nintetinib slowed down the decline over time. And this is a subgroup analysis. And if you see um, autoimmune interstitial lung disease, this is a force plot. And you can see that um, a, that if you look by subgroups um, outside of unclassifiable and HP, the benefit applied to each subgroup, including autoimmune lung disease. So this really gives us a new therapy for patients who have any of the autoimmune ILDs who are progressing. Uh, an important point on what's driving therapy, um, keep in mind this is a critical point and I want to drive this home and I want you to really uh, remember this, that just because you have control of the autoimmune disease does not mean your ILD is under control. So interstitial lung disease can progress significantly in patients with mild rheumatoid arthritis or mild scleroderma. And the opposite is true, meaning that you can have really bad rheumatoid arthritis and very mild lung disease. So the point of this slide is to make sure that you are watching both of them carefully. Don't think, don't don't feel a sense of relief that hey, they their joint disease is under control. I don't need to look at their lungs. That's not true.
Finally, survival um, survival is pretty good in patients with um, connective tissue related ILD. It is better than patients who have idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. So this slide, the dark line with the poor survival is patients with idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, and then the clear circles are patients with connective tissue related ILD. And you can see that they are, they just have a better survival, partially because they have more NSIP, which is a better uh, disease to survive. Finally, don't forget lung transplant if it's available. Patients with a connective tissue-related ILD have a good survival with lung transplant, and it's about the same as patients with IPF. I want to briefly mention as we close what we call uncharacterized or occult connective tissue disease. So this is a patients who have ILD, and they have some features of a connective tissue disease, but don't meet established criteria. Why do we care if you don't meet established criteria? Well, if you think they have it, but they don't meet criteria, it can help guide you looking for other manifestations such as esophageal dysmotility or pulmonary hypertension in patients with scleroderma. It can help you prognosticate because if they have a connective tissue disease or it's a cult, they will do better. Um, and it may change what you do in terms of therapy. So I really think we look for this, um, and I think it's important to, to look for it in all patients with ILD. How common is it? Maybe 15 to 20% of patients with ILD will have a connective tissue disease. This, these are old data. It may be even higher than that. So um, take a look for it. Even if they're not coming in complaining of joints, I think a, a screen of their blood for connective tissue disease is important. Um, and it may be really hard to distinguish those who have an underlying connective disease. Um, uh, just ordering a rheumatoid factor and an ANA is not enough. You got to order all the blood work and you have to really look at them closely and it may be difficult to distinguish. Here's some quick clues on exam. They tend to be younger and female. They'll have some skin findings. Obviously, they'll have serologies if they have um, more than one compartment involved on their CT scan. So, in, for instance, interstitial lung disease with pleural disease or pericardial disease, that's very suggestive. And then if you actually do biopsy, and there are clues on pathology. I list some of them there that will really suggest that this is connective tissue-related ILD and not idiopathic. Finally, I will mention that we have a classification for these people. Dr. R.E.A. Fisher does, uh, came up with this in 2015. We call it IPATH. And these are the criteria. You can uh, you can look up that manuscript. It, it just all it does is um, help us establish that there are patients who kind of fit in this category where they have an ILD and they have some features of autoimmune disease. And we think that they probably have a better survival than patients who have idiopathic disease. Um, but uh, you know, it, it is something to think about in all your subjects. Is it going to make a difference? I, th I think it will. And again, it'll help you follow them uh, longitudinally and look for things outside of the lungs. Uh, in summary, my main points are that all the connective tissue related ILDs, all the connective tissue diseases can have an ILD, but they are more common in some. Um, young women are, are really uh, the ones that will see the connective tissue related ILD. Uh, they commonly have an NSIP pattern on HRCT. They generally have a more favorable prognosis. Treatments consist of either anti-inflammatory or anti-fibrotic um, therapies. And at times, that connective tissue disease can be subtle and hard to diagnose in some patients. Again, thank you for having me uh, speak. Uh, there's my email address. I'm happy to have anyone contact me if there's any questions um, uh, on, the, on this talk or, or any time if you want to discuss patients. Again, thank you.